friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop before 7 a.m. <laughs> it's about the only time I can find to do these shop talks, and I hope you're enjoying them. I've heard from several of you that uh, they are quickly becoming your favorite videos, so I appreciate that very much. It's for sure there are things in the shop talks that you probably just won't see in the regular videos. We have a lot of questions and answers to get through, and again, unfortunately, we're not going to get through them all. I'm going to narrow these down and keep them a little shorter because there's just so much content. I could go on all day long. The first thing I want to do is say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of those who have sent me spare parts. Oh my gosh. I'm going to try to quickly cover each and every one of them that has sent in spare parts. I've already done in a separate set of videos some of those thank yous and, and you're going to see those here in just a moment as well. So if my shirt changes, you'll understand why. But uh, first thing here, uh, this just came in recently. David Burke sent me a set of awesome files. This one here is a gouge. This one is a flat chisel. This is a wooden handle version of one of my old chisels. It's just amazing how much it looks just exactly like my old chisels that I had. Although this one's probably a better quality. I'm trying to see what it says there. It looks like without my glasses on here. It does say Sweden, it looks like. Let me put on my specs here to read this fine print and get it in the right light too. I can't see it. Eric Anton Berg S. Giltuna, Sweden. Probably butchered the heck out of those names. But anyway, it looks like it's a Swiss steel type deal. So there you go. That's pretty nice. This one here actually says uh, Buck. It looks like maybe B-R-O-E. And then cast steel it says here on this one. This one, um, I don't see anything on it. Well, yeah, I do. There is something here, but it's really wore out. W con. It's really wore out. Lex, something like that. I, I'm sorry, I can't really read it. It's just wore out. And this one here is a match to this other one. It says Buck something also. It doesn't I can't read the rest of it. It's been filed away or worn away. But regardless, they look like they're very high quality steel and uh, we will put them to good use, David Burke. Thank you very, very, very much. I really appreciate it. David sent us a nice letter too and, and we appreciate your sentiment there very much, David. Thank you very much. These are in no particular order in terms of time frame. In fact, they're probably close to reverse order. But here is one from Kenneth Dreyer, uh, uh, Dreyer, D-R-E-W-Y-O-R, it looks like. And uh, he says he stumbled on our YouTube channel, and he says he still has a couple of hundred videos to view. <laughs> Wanted to uh, send these parts. A very, very nice letter there. These are some really cool vintage parts. It looks like mandolin tuners that are all together. I know I've seen these tuners before, but I can't remember which mandolin I've seen them on. They look like they're in very good shape for their age, especially because these are old, I can tell. So once again, uh, Ken, I really do very much appreciate it. This will go in our spare parts uh, drawer and uh, one of these days it may wind up on a mandolin. You just never know. And just to remind everyone on these spare parts, if you decide to send them to me, uh, first of all, I would certainly appreciate it. Second of all, I don't charge the customer anything for spare parts. If the spare part is something that works to fix your instrument when you send it in, you get it free of charge because for the most part, I get them free of charge and I just don't charge for them. It's just kind of a fair square deal if you ask me. And so you can rest assured if you send me your spare parts, they will go eventually to a good cause. Sometimes they'll sit in the drawer for years and years and even decades and all at once they get used. So it's very cool the way it works out. My goodness, there's quite a bit in this box here. And a little bit of it came loose and I'm just searching the box making sure I got it all. I think I do. And this one is from Edward Seymour. And it looks like Edward is in Marble Hill, Missouri. I've been there. In fact, I think I've even played music there at one time or another. If I'm not mistaken, and I could be, I think that's down by Grassy, Missouri, which is a little hole in the wall place where they used to have bluegrass festivals. In fact, my uncle is the guy that started the bluegrass festivals down there, Don Brown. So anyway, 
he sent a whole bunch of stuff and let's just kind of quickly go through it. Some, it uh, looks like I would call them shallower, or at least shallower knockoff if they're not shallower tuning keys. That's what they look like. Looks like the, all the parts are there. So that's a, you know, a full set of tuning keys that will likely wind up on an instrument someday. You just never know, which is really neat. Appreciate it. He sent several more tuning keys for mandolins, it looks like, in a bag. And it uh, looks like there's at least two full sets there. I'm not going to take them all out and do it, but there's, but there's some really... Maybe you can see them better from that side, but there's some good, good material there, too. So I appreciate that. And then we've got a, a mix-match set of things here. It looks like we've got some... Uh, String pins, which were, are always helpful and useful. And then a bag of a miscellaneous bunch of stuff here. Another set of old guitar tuning machines. And these are unique in a way that I can just tell that they're just not the standard, uh, that the round gear there is very, very sharp pointed. Uh, you don't see that very often. Usually the ends are fairly flat. Those are fairly pointed, but uh, anyway, and then there's an old bridge and some more string pins and uh, saddles and I don't know, various and sundry things. So I really do appreciate it, Ed. Thank you very much. And uh, hope things are going well down there in Marble Hill, Missouri. And here's a nice note from Paul Lyle. Paul is very complimentary and I appreciate it very much, Paul. And he said he's in his late 70s and he rides a recumbent bike and our trike, he says. Uh, he said he used to work on instruments a lot and he's got a lot of old parts laying around. And he said, here's a bunch of old banjo parts. And when he says a bunch, he means a bunch. There's a large load of parts in there for the banjos. Most of the banjo parts that you get are metal. <laughs> I, that's why I call them the five-string galvanized mechanical gadget. <laughs> so anyway, I do appreciate that, Paul, and we are always working on old banjos, and they're always missing parts, so it's always handy to have this kind of thing. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. This next one is from Ronald Rogers, and he's from Arizona and Elm, Elm Ridge or Elm? El Mirage, I think it looks like El Mirage, Arizona is the way I guess I'd pronounce that. Ronald sent me something that a few years ago would probably scare the pants off of you because it's kind of a white powdery substance and if you remember the anthrax scare, that would scare the tar out if you open this up and you see this white powdery stuff. But in this case, at least he tells me <laughs> that it is uh, morel spores is what he's telling me they are. Now, I'm going to just take that and accept it and just say, wow, thank you so much because I love morel mushrooms. But on the other hand, I've always heard and always read that no one has figured out how to produce morel mushrooms. And I've always felt that that was true because you can't buy them in a store. And anything that people like, you generally can buy in a store and somebody has found a way to commercialize it, etc. and so forth. So at the same time that I'm incredibly thankful, because I am going to try it, I'm going to spread these around out and see what happens. I still have serious doubts that these could grow morel mushrooms because if it was that simple, you would think you'd see it everywhere and you'd think you'd see morel mushrooms all over the stores and you never have and, and I don't think you ever will, but I'm floored. So I want to give it a try. If it works, I will report back later and you will see me as the happiest guy on planet Earth <laughs> because I love morel mushrooms. So, Ronald, thank you very kindly. I appreciate it. Whether it works or not, I certainly appreciate the thought and the sentiment and the nice little note you put in there as well. So, thank you very kindly. Thank you for watching the videos. Now, I think I have some old, older clips, and I say older as in a week or two ago, of more 
instrument parts that came in. I know, I remember distinctly Chuck, my good buddy, uh, the old doctor fella, uh, has sent me some more parts and things and miscellaneous tools and various uh, sundry things, a whole box full of stuff. So I'm pretty sure that's gonna be in one of the videos coming up. And there should be some other parts and things from other folks as well. Hopefully we didn't lose that footage and hopefully Melissa will find it and be able to include it in this video right now. My friends, I ask you to send me your spare parts and my goodness, did you ever. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. In no particular order, I just wanna show you what we received and we'll try to do it as quick as possible. Brand new set of uh, tuning keys for a mandolin and I say brand new, they're, they're probably used well, in fact, I can tell they are definitely used, but they look like they're new. The box says Schaller on it, but I'm sure someone bought Schaller tuning keys, put them on their mandolin, and took these off, which is perfectly fine with me. We can use these. Always repairing things like this. There was no name in this box. That's why I'm talking like I am. It also came with this um, armrest, and it had a receipt in there from Houston, Texas, All Parts Music Incorporated back on 2016 when the Scheller parts were purchased apparently. But anyway, that was all in one box. And I thank you, whoever you are. I'd call you by name if I knew your name. Another one we got here from Mike Yerger. Mike is from uh, York County, Pennsylvania. And he sent a whole lot of mandolin parts here, it looks like, mostly mandolin parts. Although these are banjo parts and even a fiddle tuning key I see in there as well. And let's see, what else? Got a mandolin type a solid bridge. Some more tuning keys that look to be in good shape. A tail piece and just a lot little screws and ferrules and things. So Mike, thank you very kindly. He's uh, complimentary on the video so thank you thank you Mike we appreciate it very much going on to the next one let's see Colleen Colleen Berry from Boston Massachusetts thank you very much she's complimentary in her little letter there too and these look to be banjo parts very nice As a matter of fact those hooks and things we use those kinds of things all the time. Very, very, very handy, Colleen. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it very much. Uh, we got one from Mark De Gennaro. <laughs> Tried to mispronounce his name a few different times. <laughs> but Mark, thank you very much. He put a nice note in there and a whole bunch of guitar parts. Uh, these are uh, the uh, string pegs and tuning keys. Look to be shallower type tuning keys for a guitar and then some of these uh, friction type keys for like dulcimers and banjos and small instruments like that that uh, need that friction type key even dulcimers use those so thank you very very much mark i really do appreciate it very very much i really do it's going to be so nice to have all these extra parts in the drawer you know and we can go thumb through them and find what we need this came from Dave Wheeler in Olympia, Washington. And again, it's just miscellaneous guitar tuning keys. And we do appreciate that. You never know, maybe one little part out of one of those keys would be what we need. So, perfect. And here's a large box from R. Wells. And this is a large box. So from Ralph Wells, and he's in Appleton, Wisconsin. And he has a very nice letter here and we appreciate it very much. Matter of fact, it's a quite a lengthy little letter here. <laughs> Look at all the parts in here. And he's got it all bagged. I mean, there's all kinds of parts. These are miscellaneous ebony pieces. Uh, mandolin tuning keys here, apparently. And these look to be pretty old and some different, and, and a tailpiece, a really old, kind of decorative tailpiece, kind of neat. Lots of miscellaneous tuning keys, just all kinds of buttons and things there to, to work with. Just a bunch of stuff. I'm not sure what this is. Looks like a, a box. It looks, I would say it would be rosin or something, but I haven't opened it up yet. No, it looks, it's individual pieces of something. Oh, little pieces of mother of pearl and it uh, looks like ivory little pieces in there and stuff. Just all kinds of like, almost like inlay and uh, things to fix the ends of a violin bow I, I saw quickly just by glancing. A whole bunch more 
tuning keys. Golly, he really sent a huge stash here. His stash alone was more than what I had in stock, trust me. Here's a whole bunch of, looks like ivory pieces and or bone pieces at least for saddles that we can take out and use. And a bunch of the uh, screws for the ends of violin bows and some more uh, tips for violin bows. So he's got a lot of stuff here. Gears and string, buzzing screws. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what that means. This is sealed in an envelope and this says uh, string posts for steel string guitars. This is sealed again. I'm not gonna open these up right now. String posts for guitars. So, wow. Ralph, thank you, thank you, thank you. Seriously, what you sent me here is more than I had in stock, trust me. So uh, just your thing alone more than doubled what I had already. Not to mention what everyone else sent. So it's, it's awesome, it really is. I knew people would send me stuff. I wasn't quite sure I'd get this much, and this is this is very, very nice. And then lastly, but not least, uh, Charles sent me another care package, Charles Kelly, and I'm not sure where he's located now, I think in Florida, but I'm not positive of that even. But anyway, uh, Charles sent me another large package of parts and miscellaneous things here. I can't get it on camera real well. Maybe I'll turn the camera down, it'd be better. So we'll turn the camera down in this case, because this is all loose stuff in a little drawer. I mean, there's tools in here, there's all kinds of mother of pearl, just all kinds of little parts and screws and miscellaneous things. and. Charles is a doctor, I believe, that uh, I believe he's retired. He's, I believe he's told me he's in his 90s. He was a luthier. He built and repaired instruments. And he made quite a few instruments that I know were on display. Here's a whole bunch of wire and different string pegs and nuts and all kinds of parts. I mean, just all kinds. Tail pins, strap buttons, just all kinds of things. Some oil, it looks like. So Charles, thank you once again. I do really appreciate it very much. This appears to be something like an inlay pattern type deal that you could stick on and then lacquer over apparently. Charles has sent me a lot of stuff over the years. So to all of you who have sent parts, thank you, thank you, thank you. I really do appreciate it. And more than that, it like I told you before, I don't sell or charge anything for any of these parts. You know, it's just going to help someone else out in the future or even help restore one of those old vintage instruments. So it's a very generous thing you did and I really, really do appreciate it. Thank you. Hello my friends, Ron and Pam Johnson from Danville, Illinois are here in the shop today and I just did a rather extensive detailed setup on his Taylor guitar. We changed a few things. It had a man-made saddle, a man-made material. I'm not exactly sure what it was. Some people would say it's micarta, but I, this wasn't like any micarta I've ever seen, if that's what it was. Some people would say it was tusk. I'd say it was not tusk. It was something that had some kind of a fiber built into the edge of it, almost like a fiberglass. And anyway, we took that saddle out and we've replaced it with antler, as you would imagine. And we've also tweaked it and lowered the action, tightened up the truss out a little bit. In other words, we tried to set it up just like another guitar that he really liked. And I think we got pretty darn close. I won't say it's perfect, but it's pretty darn close. So, well, I'd say it was perfect. You'd say it was perfect? Yeah. Well, good, Ron. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Ron's a pretty good picker. Why don't you just listen to Ron pick a little bit here while we're uh, looking at the guitar. <laughs> I can't find it. And of course, right on cue, the air conditioning had to kick on, so that made that background noise there, and hopefully you could hear that. I, I hope you could, because it was very good. 
Thank you, Ron, for coming all that way from Illinois, and uh, I hope you enjoy that setup. Oh, that thank you, Jerry. It was my pleasure, and yeah. thanks for all the great work you did to this thing. It's just, I couldn't imagine it being this good. <laughs> well, great. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed a look at all of those parts that came in. It was very nice, very thoughtful of everyone to send those to us. Again, you know, you could say, well, it's me benefiting, but in a way, it's really not me benefiting whatsoever other than the ability to fix someone's instrument easier. It's you in the long run that is benefiting, meaning the general public, because uh, you're going to get free parts, basically, and your instrument's going to get fixed because of the generosity there of those folks that are sending that stuff in. So I really do appreciate it very much. Now, here's just a quick preview. I'll tell you what the preview's about before I flash this up there, because I'm not going to hold it up there very long. If you remember in our earlier video, I showed instruments that were going to be shown in future videos and how difficult they were. And this one was for sure, absolutely, the most difficult of the difficult. And here it is. That's just a quick preview. You will know this as chocolate later. Let me tell you, there's at least, well, I know there's lots of kinds of chocolate, but there's kind of two different versions of chocolate, if you will, the sweet and the bitter or there's the dark and the milk chocolate and things like that, but, but we're talking sweet and bitter. This chocolate was the very, very, very most bitter chocolate you ever saw in your life when it came in the shop. And now it's turned into sweet chocolate and it will be very sweet very shortly. So I hope you enjoy that little preview there because trust me, you're gonna wanna see old chocolate come back to life. Out of this giant pile of questions and answers, which I just don't have time to get through, here's a few that I'm going to try to cover this morning. And if I get through these quickly, we'll pick another one or two out of this pile. But I don't know how quick this is going to be. I never do know because I don't script anything. I just talk right off the top of my head, as most of you probably have already figured that out. Okay, so here's one from... Comcast One, he says, I saw you mention my GIF in a previous video. He sent me the big piece of ebony, and he says he hopes it makes it on a mandolin someday. That might even make it on a guitar or whatever. I'm gonna save it, honestly, because I don't generally make my own fretboards anymore, but occasionally I get you know, a request for some unique thing, like say a three-quarter size mandolin, where I would have to make my own fretboard because you can't buy one. So I will save that piece of ebony for some event like that where I absolutely have to make the fretboard. Likely as not, it won't make it to one of my standard mandolins because I typically buy the fretboards. The reason is you just can't make them any better than you can buy them. And if I could make them better, I would just make them. There's no point in making one because you can buy them cheaper than you can make them. Anyway, I do appreciate it though, and it will go to a good cause eventually. So thank you very kindly for the gift. Now, he says, enough love talk. He, he says, my question is this. The neck angle is too flat, so before you attach the fretboard on, is it okay to bevel the fretboard itself? In other words, taper it thinner at the nut, you know, thicker at the tail end. At least I think that's the way he's talking about tapering. And it could be the other way around, I suppose. But anyway, the answer is yes but there's a huge, very huge caveat. And the caveat is this, it really depends how thick your fretboard is, and more than that, it really depends on how much meat you have between the bottom of the fret slots and the bottom of the fretboard. In other words, you know, if you only have just a tiny little bit, well, as soon as you start beveling it, each fret is going to separate and you're going to have a whole bunch of fretboards instead of one fretboard, you know, if that makes sense to you. So with the caveat of, yes, there's enough thickness there to do it, you could do that. In fact, I have done it in the past. 
you know, if you just need to tweak it a degree or two, I've even done it on my belt sander. I'll take the fretboard and hold it with a little bit more pressure on the nut end, if you will, with just a little bit more pressure on this belt sander and very light pressure on the, say, the 12th fret area, and therefore you get a little bit of a taper to your fretboard. I've done it many times, so yeah, I don't see a problem with that, and as long as you're not doing it you know, where it looks crazy weird. You know, like the way I do it, you really can't even tell I did it. So I hope that answers your question. The answer is yes, you can do that, but with a caveat. Okay, the next one is from Philip Alley. Philip Alley, A-L-L-E-Y. Uh, that's the way I pr pronounce it, and he's from Louisville, Kentucky. And by the way, down there in Louisville, I'll say hello to Steve Norman as well because he has one of my Rosa mandolins and he's one of my biggest cheerleaders. He loves his Rosa mandolin and he is a fine mandolin picker. He really is a good musician. Could pick circles around me on the mandolin. So Phil, look up Steve Norman if you don't already know him because he's right down there in your neighborhood. <laughs> But Phil's question is about shrinking pick guards. And the reason I chose his question is because it kind of leads a little bit into a couple of other things and a few side comments that I'll probably make. He, you know me, I don't really get off on tangents very often. <laughs> I can't say that without laughing. Anyway, he's talking about, you know, he's seen a lot in my videos where the shrinking pick guard has caused cracking. And he's wondering why we just don't make the pick guard out of wood. So it would more or less just solve that problem where you wouldn't have the shrinking of the plastic. Let me first say that it's not a bad idea. You can definitely make them out of wood. And in fact, on my custom guitars, I do make them out of wood. The fact is though, that may or may not work to fix the problem about the cracking. And the reason is that different woods will expand and contract at different rates. And for instance, you know, ebony being denser uh, will expand and contract probably differently than say spruce because it's not very dense and they will absorb moisture and expel moisture. And there's where I get off into my side comment. <laughs> and that is that, you know, there's lots of myths out there about wood and moisture. The main comment is, oh, this thing is dried out. Oh, this wood is so dry. Yeah, sort of, kind of, that's sort of true. I'm really about the only guy out there in the field spouting this. I really am. There, almost no one else actually believes this. I'm here to tell you for sure that it doesn't really work like most people think it works. And 99% you know, I usually go to the 80-20 rule, but on this, I go to the 99% rule. 99% of the humidity stuff you hear, and especially from music stores and these people that are supposedly know, 99% of it, in my opinion, is baloney. Here's why. Wood just doesn't work the way they talk about it working. They talk about it like it just expels moisture for the rest of its life. It doesn't do that. You know in your own house that in the summer things expand and in the winter they contract. And your guitar will do the same thing all year long and for the rest of its life. In the summertime it's going to expand which in itself causes a lot of cracking. And in my book and in my camp, on it, me standing out in my field, I say that's 10 times worse than the drying. And the reason is, here's the reason, and it's just black and white, common sense. I don't see how I could explain it any better than this right here. When they dry the wood in a kiln, they dry it down to about 6% if you're gonna make instruments out of it. On your best, driest day, you're not gonna get it to dry down to 6%. Not unless you put it in a really hot attic and you're in a fairly dry climate, are you gonna get it down to 6%. It just ain't gonna happen. Sitting in your living room, in your house, that instrument will never dry down to 6%. And I say never in giant capital bold letters, it will never dry down to 6%. Then there's the guy who lives at the North Pole. 
heats with wood and in a single room cabin and doesn't have a drop of moisture anywhere. Yeah, okay. Under extreme, 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 extreme conditions, like somebody said out in an area of Australia that their humidity level gets down to some crazy low number like that. Okay, under the, some crazy extreme, yeah, potentially you could, I guess. But the rest of us, you know, like 99% of the rest of us don't live in that crazy extreme. And your instrument will never dry down to 6%. So my point of saying that and explaining that like that is me personally, I will never, and I say never again in giant bold capital letters, I will never humidify an instrument because that expands that wood and that causes cracks more than anything else. That's where you get those finished cracks in your instrument because it's popping the finish. It's expanding and it's popping the finish. Shrinking causes wrinkles in the finish or even chip out in the finish where it's shrunk together and it can't come any closer and it's trying to come closer and it causes little flaking chips on the cracks. And you've seen that too, if you've seen Vacha on instruments. So shrinking, it will cause cracks but it generally causes wrinkling or crinkling out, you know, chipping out like glass of the finish. Expansion causes those hairline cracks in your finish. So your wood for the rest of its life will continue to expand and contract. And from the moment it comes out of the kiln, it's drinking water. I'm sorry, I will never humidify an instrument. And I know I'm the only guy standing out there in the field spouting this but it is 99.9% .9 marketing hype. Ask me if I feel strongly about that. I'm off the soapbox. See what you started asking that question? <laughs> Philip Alley, you just put my neck right on the chopping block and 99% of the comments are gonna be, I'm chopping your head off. <laughs> so, so thanks, Phil. <laughs> Guys, I'm, y you understand. I really am sincere about what I said. I really am. Obviously, if you want to humidify your instrument, feel free. You know, I don't have a problem with it. Seriously, I don't. I just wouldn't do it if I were you. That's all. We'll move on to the next one. I want to go get a drink. <laughs> okay, this next one is my favorite one of this session. Not for any particular reason other than it's from a lady. Kim Ward, and she has a rhetorical question in her first opening thing. She says, I'm a 64-year-old female guitarist from Moorestown, New Jersey, and my name is Kim Ward. I have some questions for you, but first I want to ask a rhetorical question. There are no questions and comments from women. They're missing out. There are a lot of female guitarists but probably not very many female luthiers. Am I on the right track? Well, I'd say yes. I mean, I think that's pretty dead on, but there are a few female luthiers out there, and the few that I have seen are very good at what they do. In fact, I kind of live in fear that more women will start doing this. <laughs> <laughs> because that'll put me out of business because women are always better at doing whatever they're doing than men are. So there you go. Well, I mean, with the rare exception of just the physical strength or whatever, but uh, in terms of just, you know, good hand coordination, fingers, you know, artistic abilities, etc., and so forth, generally speaking, women are better at it than men are. So you won't get no argument from me. Can you tell I supervised about, you know, eight to 20 women working for AT&T. I generally chose women over men whenever I could, and not because I'm a womanizer or anything, it's because I knew they would work. They are hard workers, no question about it. So you won't get no arguments from me. Okay, um, and I'll just add one last thing, and my most recent proof of that theory about women working harder is Melissa. She is one hard-working lady and does a wonderful job for me. Really, I couldn't be happier that she's here and helping me out of the hole that I dug myself into. <laughs> so thank you, Melissa. Her question now, it's a really good question and you know, it's one of those where I can't just answer it in one word either. 
The question is, she's got a Fender Acoustic Electric. She says it has a dead fret. I'm not sure I would describe it that way based on the rest of her description. Uh, maybe that's a good description. Maybe I'm just not understanding it because sometimes it's hard to convey exactly what's going on in a, in a note like this. She said it's the 10th fret. The first string can't play anything on it. So to me, when you can't play anything on the first string, that's more than just a dead fret. Okay. And then she said two strings two through five are okay, but the sixth string is buzzing. Okay. And then she goes on to describe that she lowered the action. I think she took a shim out from under the saddle is what I think I remember reading in here. I'm a terrible reader, by the way, as you know. Anyway, she said it worked for about seven years, but it's really beginning to act up. You know, she's wondering, are all the rest of the strings just going to go buzzy and all this? Okay, she said the action is pretty darn low. She had to lower it after she bought the guitar because it was killing her fingers. I don't want to oversimplify this, but generally speaking, it's pretty simple. First, you flatten all the frets. You recrown them. And then you set your action at your saddle and at your nut. I mean, it's really that basic. You level the frets, you recrown them, set the action here and here. And it's just pretty much that simple. So my thought is that you've got at least one high fret, probably multiple high frets. Most likely that high fret is somewhere around, probably toward where it connects to the body. Uh, based on your description, but it could be almost anywhere. Uh, if you can't play anything on the first string, then I would say the high fret could be almost anywhere, really, but probably more toward the neck area. I would physically do like I do. I would hold your guitar up. I would sight right down the top of your frets, and I would look all around, right straight down the top of your frets. If you really make yourself you can look right down those frets and you'll probably see where your problem is. For instance, you could have too much underbow or relief as they like to call it. I call it underbow because if you can see it, it's generally way more than relief. It could be just perfectly flat or you might actually see an overbow or if you really get good at it, you can specifically put your finger on the high fret. And I can do that. And I, you know, I've shown it in the shop bazillions of times. Caleb has seen me do it. I can do it. So you can look right down your fretboard and you can probably pick out the specific high fret just by looking right down your fretboard. I know, I know. I'll get people telling me that I'm just full of it. But come here and I'll show you. I can do it. So anyway, that's really all there is to it. I mean, it's just that simple. I like to get the fretboard just about as flat as I can get it before I level the frets. In other words, with the strings off of it, I like to be able to look down the fretboard and see that there's not a huge underbow. You don't want that. And I don't generally like an overbow, but I would prefer at that stage there be a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of overbow. I mean, like so tiny you can barely see it at all. I would prefer that as to an underbow. Because if you've got an underbow when the strings are off of it, then when you put the strings on it, you got a big underbow, you know. Okay. I hope that makes sense to you, Kim. I really did like your question, and I understand your rhetorical question very well. I hope more women get into it. I just live in fear that they will. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kim. Okay, and this next question follows up to Kim's question very well, I think. John, um, <laughs> ain't no way I'm going to try to say that. <laughs> there ain't no way. <laughs> T-S-A-M-B-O-U-N-I-E-R-I-S. <laughs> Sorry, John. I, you know, I just... It's too early in the morning, and my tongue is wrapped around my eye teeth, and there's no way I could see what I'm saying there. So, <laughs> anyway, he does have a great question, though. John's question, and by the way, John's from New Jersey. He says, I'm a big fan of your channel, and I have a question for your next shop talk. How would you straighten the neck 
on a guitar with no truss rod? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because it's a really good question. And again, in my opinion, there's a lot of hype out there. It's not exactly hype because it's sort of true. It sort of does work, but it won't last. And that is, you'll see people take a heat lamp, put it on the neck, take blocks of wood and things and a clamp. Like if it's got a huge underbow, they'll force back bow in it, if that's what you want to call it, or I call it overbow. But anyway, they'll force that into it with a heat lamp and they'll let it sit. Now, I won't say that doesn't ever work, because it could, I think. It would really depend on a lot of circumstances, whether that will work permanently or not. It would depend on what kind of glue it was glued with, how hot the heat is, the kind of woods, different things like that. There's a lot of variables, but under the right conditions, that could work just fine, and the glue would reset itself, and it would hold that new set that you put in it. But I would also say that under most circumstances that it won't hold forever. And the reason is because, you know, wood has a memory and it'll go back to where it was. Only under the perfect circumstances will that be a permanent fix. But it will work under those circumstances. So how would I do it rather than just take a heat lamp and blocks of wood and a clamp? Well, basically I do almost exactly the same thing. The difference being that I would go to the trouble of taking the fretboard off first. And I would clean the fretboard and I would clean the top of the neck. Then I might put the clamps and all that stuff back on it. I would put the glue on there, that, you know, like Type Bond Original or something like that. I would put the glue back on there. And then I would probably do almost the same technique with the clamps and everything. But this time when it dries with that tight bond and, you know, getting it glued into that position, it will stay. And it will stay a very, very long time that way. So that's the only difference there is that, you know, I would just do it more specifically, I guess you'd say, more mechanically. You know, the first way will work under the right conditions. But the second way will work, period. So that's how I do it. It's a lot of work, it's not simple, but yet it's doable. So John, I hope, uh, well I know I didn't butcher your name because I spelled it, but <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you, John. The last question I'm gonna take time for today is from Rick Cooksey. His question is about the top on his guitar. He's got the Willie Nelson effect going on, and I'm sure Melissa will put that up on the screen for you. In other words, where his pick hand comes down, he's about to dig a hole through the top of the guitar. He's wondering what to do about that. The truth is there's no easy, simple answer on that. It's like your mom told you, if it hurts when you do that, don't do that, you know? <laughs> so I think the first thing I would work on would be my technique. And I don't mean to sound smug or mean or anything, you know, I would try to work on your technique and try not to hit that. It's kind of a habit you get into and you do that. And so you start digging a hole. Now, how do you fix it once you got a hole? Well, that ain't that easy to do. He's wondering, you know, should I, you know, maybe route out half of the thickness of that and inlay a thin layer of new wood there. You could do that, and if you did a really good job, it would be fine. Now, he's talking about inlaying a different kind of wood, like a hardwood or something. I would only do that if you're a really good artist and you could decorate it and make it look really cool and look like it was on purpose. You know, if you could do that, then it would probably be fine. But the problem with using two different kinds of wood there, again, that expansion contraction thing, is could bite you in the rear end on that, potentially. Not probably any big deal, but it could. If that was a really big concern, well then just the fact that you glue a bridge to the, your top would cause problems, and that doesn't generally cause problems. So you'd probably be okay there. If I was going to go that much trouble I'd probably just inlay new spruce or whatever the wood is if it's western cedar spruce I can't tell from the picture I would probably just find matching grain inlay it in there and so it you know looked like it was pretty much original that way it's a tough problem to fix there's a myriad of ways to fix it and I guess I'd have to leave you hanging and say you're kind of on your own there on how you want to fix that, but uh, you're on the right track, I guess. The last way you could fix it would just be to put a clear over it and you know, you just clear, build up the clear and then just sand it back off and buff it out. 
you'd still see it under there, but you'd have it leveled. And that clear would also be, become your new pick guard, if you will. So you could do it a lot of different ways. I hope that helps you. That's Richard Cooksey. I didn't see on here where he's from, but he was very complimentary of the channel. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. I hope you all enjoyed this edition of Shop Talk. Hope you laughed with me and not at me. <laughs> thank you so much for watching. If you're not yet subscribed, please do that and please share these videos with your friends. Thank you very much.